Hello, everyone. I'm uh, very honored and very privileged to uh, welcome you all to our monthly TCIPG seminar series on technologies for a resilient power grid. Um, I'm particularly honored uh, to introduce, introduce Hank Kensington to you this morning. Uh, Hank is the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Energy's Office of Electricity and uh, Energy Reliability. Hank is responsible for OE's efforts to accelerate grid modernization across the U.S. in the deployment of advanced digital communications and control technologies, uh, the things we all know as smart grid technologies. In this role, he directs the $3.4 billion smart grid investment program funded under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, to upgrade the power grid. Uh, Hank has a, a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical and Nuclear Engineering from Virginia Polytech Institute, and he has a Master's Degree in Energy Management from George Washington University. In addition to all of those uh, amazing things he's, he's doing to, to press forward in, in the smart grid area, I should say that, that we very much appreciate uh, Hank and all the team at Department of Energy for their support uh, of our TCIPG effort uh, and technical guidance as well as their organizational support. So all, as always, for those of you who know, um, we have uh, a number of you online. We have a number of us here in the audience at Illinois. And for those of you at Illinois, if you'd like to ask a question, please go to one of the microphones. We always have to use a microphone. And if you're somewhere else, uh, ask a question by typing it into the chat window of your WebEx browser, and we'll ask the question for you. So Hank, we're really happy to have you here, and uh, please take it away. Thanks, Bill. Glad to be in Illinois. Do you hear me okay? Everything okay? We can hear you first. Everybody in that audience, yes, sir. Okay, very good, very good. Well, thanks, Bill. Um, this afternoon, I want to talk a little bit about our, our smart grid efforts uh, in, in 2009. Um, uh, as many of you know, the Recovery Act allocated $4.5 billion for the, uh, for the deployment of smart grid technologies. So today, we're going to talk to you a little bit about, about our, pro our progress, um, some of the accomplishments that have been made so far. Uh, some of the lessons learned we've uh, been able to garner after deploying the smart meters, as well as uh, distribution automation technologies and synchrophaser technologies uh, um, throughout the grid working with our utility partners. Um, so, I'm, I'm doing the third. So, first of all, before we get going, I want to thank uh, Bill and all the folks at TCEPG for all their hard work. and. You guys are making great strides out there, and we really appreciate all your work. Uh, thanks a lot. You guys are doing a fantastic job. Also want to thank uh, all the uh, industry vendor participants. I think I may have missed some, uh, but uh, Bill, you all have been able to uh, capture the, the attention of a number of folks out there in the industry, and I think it's fantastic. Uh, that just shows you the work you're doing is relevant. Uh, to real applications, and, and it's really important. So thank you very much for all that, to all the, the partners out there, too. So thanks a lot. So let's start off with a little motivation. Why, why are we doing these smart grid technologies in the first place? Uh, the department was actually the, uh, under the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. Uh, the, uh, it was, excuse me, the uh, United States uh, we got funding, well, actually it was authorized under ESA, E-I-S-A, uh, and the uh, United States uh, will support grid modernization. And as uh, President Obama said, we'll fund a better, smarter electricity grid and train workers to build it. Uh, the report there on the left is actually a report that followed about a year ago, actually June of 2011. Uh, so the, the Energy Independence and Security Act put forth the policy of the United States and the policy framework we developed uh, established how the administration was going to pursue uh, smart grid technologies. And that included four, four actually legs of the stool, enable cost-effective smart grid investments, unlock innovation, 
empower consumers with information and secure the grid properly so what is a smart grid what's it look like well these are the characteristics that are that are put forth actually in ESA 2007 I'll just go through them briefly they're rather high level but they do capture a pretty broad range of what we're trying to do empower consumers with access to information accommodate all forms of generation and storage including renewable technologies and distributed technologies enables new products and markets increases power quality or for a connected economy with advanced control systems optimizes our assets it uses them efficient efficiently through the use of better sensing equipment anticipates a response to the services disturbances this is getting to the whole notion of self-healing that when a system fails how do we separate it and and isolate the disturbance and put the other customers and loads back online and finally I really will highlight this last one operates resiliently against attack and natural disaster according to the the act here a smart grid addresses security from the outset from the beginning as a requirement for every element and ensures an integrated and balanced approach across the system so those are the kind of characteristics but that's a little bit hard to visualize so I've put together this is a little bit complicated but the chart on the top is actually courtesy of Florida Power and Light this is a kind of a snapshot of their project that we're funding under the smart grid investment grant as you can see it's pretty end-to-end I say end-to-end it goes from generation through the transmission down into distribution into the consumers and actually they're doing some workforce and consumer education work to to educate consumers but the point I want to make here was the the projects that we're funding cut across this whole swap from the district transmission distribution and into the customers through AMI systems and below that is the it's a kind of generic architecture if you will of the communications networks for smart grid technologies and the communications networks are a really key key element in all the smart grid and this is what a lot of our funding is going towards is actually deploying these communications whether it be fiber or wireless or cellular but as you can see the different domains of the smart grid require have different cyber security requirements they have different reliability not reliable different latency different bandwidth requirements but in the end you want these things to be able to communicate end-to-end so under the Recovery Act we actually got about 4.5 billion dollars but from the onset we realized that deploying that what grid modernization is more than just about technology so what we have here is more of a portfolio of projects the that address the technology as well as some R&D as well as workforce as well as standards development that we provided funding to NIST to help develop the interoperability framework I'll talk about that in a little bit as well as other funding to think look at things like transmission planning and technical assistance to states to help because in many of these projects needed to be approved at the policy level at the state level through public utility commissions so we developed a portfolio of activities to help drive the grid modernization but the the smart grid investment grants is the largest portion there the green portion let's see if this works there we go look at that right there is the green portion and that's the smart grid investment grants I love it so the smart grid these what are we trying to accomplish we have three kind of high-level objectives here first is accelerate deployment so from our perspective the just deploying these projects and the technologies is is not really our end state what we want to do and I'll show you why in a minute we actually want to accelerate the deployment excuse me just a minute I'm drying up try to deploy these technologies get lessons learned so we then leverage that to catalyze other investments we're going to do that by measuring the impacts and benefits in a way that's comparable one of the issues we've had up front is many of these technologies they're not really new but the we don't have a lot of data that's consistent on what the impact of these technologies are what the costs are what the benefits are 
and i'll show you the process that we've developed to to try to make that a little bit more scientific and as we're going along the way we want to try to build in the cyber security protections and develop interoperability standards <coughs> Uh, when I said to, we're trying here, this shows why. Uh, is that us, David? Or yeah. Okay. I don't know how to get rid of that, but anyway. Um, why we're trying to accelerate these projects? This little green dot here represents the funding that we have. We put in 3.4 billion dollars, which was leveraged by the private sector with another 4.5. <coughs> Excuse me. Six billion dollars, um, and then uh, <coughs> I'm losing my voice here. Do you want some water? Yeah. Some um, so we have two estimates here. This one is from EPRI, and it uh, they looked at what the cost of deploying smart grid technologies would be to fully modernize the U.S. power grid, and this number comes to about 348 billion to about 476. Uh, there's reasons for these discrepancies, but I'm just trying to give you kind of a ballpark estimate of what we really need to... We have a dysfunctional mile. There we go. Uh, to modernize the grid over the next 20 years. And this is an estimate done by the Borala Group. And their estimate was up to about 880 billion. So while the 7.9 billion sounds like a lot of money even here in Washington, it's really just a drop in the bucket compared to what we really need to fully modernize the grid. So our goal is to, through the application of these technologies, learn from these, get lessons learned, develop the data on the benefits, the cost, uh, share that information, share the data, and collaborate with our, our industry partners to uh, further accelerate and catalyze more and uh, more in private sector investments. So the projects we have, we have 99 projects across the U.S. Our largest project is, uh, our funding is about 200 million, but uh, I think Florida Power and Light down here is about $650 million. They put in more than their 50%. They put in about 450 million. Center Point's another very large one. But you can see we're in every state, we touch every state except for Alaska. Uh, we also have projects in Hawaii and Guam. So to what are these projects trying to do? So we've tried to show here how the funding was allocated across those domains. Uh, a total of $580 million going into transmission systems. That's mainly synchrophaser technology to enhance the wide area visibility. In the distribution space, we've got about $1.96 billion to provide automation, distribution automation, improve reliability, bulk bar control. Those are some of the applications. Uh, 3.96 uh, in, in the AMI space for smart meters, the networks, the communication networks, and then into the home through devices, uh, smart thermostats, uh, in-home displays. So just try to get a representation of uh, what some of the, the uh, assets are. Uh, by 2015, we estimate we'll deploy about 800 synchrophaser units. To, to put that in perspective, when we started, there was 166 network phaser units across the U.S. So when we get this completed in three or about four years, uh, we'll have about 1,000 synchrophasers covering the U.S. I'll show you a chart. Uh, so we'll have uh, pretty much wide area visibility across all major transmission corridors in the U.S. when we're completed. In the distribution area, this was a little bit more difficult to measure. Uh, our goal is about, uh, I think it's 6,500 circuits. There's 160,000 feeders in the U.S., we estimate. So we're going to touch about, I think, about 5% of those circuits. Uh, and we'll deploy about 15 and a half million meters uh, by the time we're finished. Uh, my presentation title said 11 million. Actually, today we're, more, we're at 12 million now. So we've made significant progress here. Um, so to put this in context, when we started, there was 8 million 
smart mayors in the u s and in the whole u s there is about one hundred forty three thousand metered i mean residential and consumer i mean in commercial metered points in the u s so so i have one hundred forty three million we're about ten percent of those hundred forty three million but when we finish the total will be around we estimate about twenty five million consumer including uh... what's already deployed but we're already beyond that number uh... so we're estimated to be about thirty five million uh... by twenty fifteen so you were have about twenty five percent of the u s uh... we actually have some states uh... i think or some utilities and some states that will have almost eighty percent deployment southern california edison will have about uh... over eighty percent deployment uh... i think florida power and light some others about five of them will have very significant penetration of smart meters so what are we what are we going to get for all this okay i mean that's that's the real the real uh... uh... goal here so we try to capture here some these are the uh... applications uh, of the various technologies when we implement them and these are the benefits down this column here. So we're showing here, for example, consumer-based demand management programs using AMI smart meters, pricing technologies, uh, what we're going to get some capital expenditures reduction as well as energy use reduction, as well as reduced electricity costs to consumers, as well as lower, lower pollution and enhanced uh, system flexibility. So this is just to give you a sense of some of the benefits to the end users and the utilities that we hope to provide through the deployment of these technologies. But the question is how are we really going to measure all this, right? So how are we going to get the data and measure these technologies? So we put together a there I am, a, um, a uh, metrics and benefits framework actually working with EPRI and this is posted on our, our on website uh, on smartgrid.gov, mentioned that here, smartgrid.gov, where all this information is, uh, to provide a common framework so that we can measure and get data and measure and make assessments in a com across projects. So that they're all, we can look at the assets for the application, we'll look at the functions that that provides. For example, this is an example here uh, of a volt bar situation. The mechanism, the impact it provides, improves feeder voltages and regulations. What is the benefit? It reduces feeder feeder losses. We're, we uh, try to monetize this, come up with about sixty dollars. Again, this is just an example. Sixty dollars per megawatt hour, and at the end, we put a monetary number on it. So we're using this framework, and we have a tool that will help you do this yourself uh, to look at your benefits and your technology to uh, calculate the benefits consistently across all the projects. So all these 99 projects so on a monthly basis, they're submitting us data. Uh, they submit us invoices and they submit the build metrics, the number of meters, the number of switches. And then every six months, every six months they uh, send us data, hourly data from the meters uh, for every day, for every uh, month and for the year. So we're getting all this data it's all going into a data hub that's located at the National uh, at NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab out in Denver. And the word uh, using the processor and some uh, algorithms they develop out there to then download that and compare the data. And I'll show you some of the results in just a minute. So are, are we making progress? So everyone wants to know are we making progress here in Washington? Everybody wants a number. You know, they, we have to have metrics, benefits. Um, uh, are, we get, are we making sure that we're getting, providing taxpayers the, the bang for the buck? Uh, so one of the questions uh, we had, so uh, one of my uh, uh, more elder colleagues came to me one day and says, you know, we've actually been deploying these kind of technologies for quite a while. It's just that we just try, started calling them smart grid technologies back in 2003. I said, really? So he, he's put me on to this project here. This is the Athens project that we funded with the Athens Utility Board in 1985. And you can look at what they're doing here. They're integrating automated uh, distribution equipment, 
disconnect switches, transformer load taps, capacitors, even down into the appliances. They even have smart meters here, and the smart meters are using the telephone line. So they didn't add any communications. They're using existing telephone lines. And here's an example that calls in through a rotary telephone that went back to this huge SCADA system. But they're doing some of the same applications, and this was a very successful project. So they ask you, so we ask yourself, so what's changed, right? What's different now that was different in '85? Because it really, we really didn't get that uh, technology moving into the into the market. Uh, so what I did was I looked at, well, this is the computer PDP-11. Uh, some of you folks out there might remember a PDP-11. Uh, this is a computer they use for processing data uh, on that project, uh, but it, it was really used for some experimentation and some of the uh, application work. And I looked at what's, how does that compare to a smart meter today? So, and, and Bill, this might be a challenge for some of your students to, if you can back up these numbers, these are uh, back of the envelope numbers that we came up with. Uh, the we estimated that this meter today has about 88 times the processing power of this $200,000 PDP-11 set. So I think, I mean, this just indicates to me how the, the, what we've done through the internet, through communications, advanced technologies, computing technologies, how that has helped us in so many other areas. So where are we today? What kind of progress have we made? Uh, this chart has a lot of info on it, so I'll try and uh, walk you through it a little bit. This is actually where we were with the Smart Grid Investment Agreement as of December 31st, 2012. So this number here is the gray bars are where we think we'll be in, at the end of the deployment. So it's a billion dollars in transmission assets. And this, this blue, dark blue one is where we are in December. So we've deployed in the transmission sector here $282 million in assets. And that near, uh, accounts for 540 synchro phasers out of our planned 800. And in the, uh, let's move down in here into the smart meter space, AMI and customer systems, we spent uh, $3.2 billion. And these numbers include our cost share out of the 4.5 to complete. And of that, we're 11.7 out of 50.5. So we're uh, pro making significant progress. The last, we're pretty much on schedule. We will have some projects that will um, uh, be extended due to, uh, mainly due to weather outages uh, from projects that uh, have caused the, the projects to be delayed. So I said we were, we developed a, a analytical framework, a way to measure the progress. Uh, just give you a couple of examples. Uh, these reports, I'll show you the reports in a minute, uh, came out in our, in our February reports we just released uh, of some what the projects are finding and some of the results. This is from Oklahoma Gas and Electric uh, with 775,000 uh, customers and 770 megawatts of generation. Uh, they implemented a two-year study uh, to look at demand reduction down there to see how they can reduce peak load uh, through the use of pricing programs like critical peak pricing and smart meters and in-home displays and what was what was the value of the home displays, what was the value of smart thermostats, how many people could they get to sign up. And what they found was they were able to reduce the peak demand by up to 30 uh, percent. Their smart hours program, they found that they saved an average of $150 per household in the summer of 2011. They, the average peak reduction is 1.3 kilowatts. So they decided they're gonna roll this out to 140,000 customers over the next couple of years in their territory. And through that and saving this 1.3 kilowatts times 144,000 customers, they're gonna be able to defer the construction of this whole natural gas fire peaking plant. So this is doing pretty much what they thought they would do, uh, but it's really good data to begin again to confirm, and it'll save uh, a considerable amount of money as well as, as, well as uh, environmental impact. Uh, this is some results on uh, distribution automation technologies uh, down in Florida Power and Light. 
they've got forty four point six million customers there was seventy thousand miles of power lines and they employed two hundred thirty six automated fuse which is on seventy five circuits in your area along with the sensing the automation control technologies fault occurrence smart switching distribution management systems and they will they found they were able to improve what's called SADI or system average interruption duration index by twenty four percent I won't go through all these numbers which meant that they decreased the average outage duration from seventy two minutes down to fifty four minutes and if you look at the momentary interruptions so that that's the duration then we have the frequency which is they reduce that number from one to zero point six one occurrences in the six months and they reduce the moments out down to from twelve point six seven eight to eight point two so this is very significant results in the secret phase of technology area this I'm just showing here on the left these little blue dots are the secret phases that were deployed before the Recovery Act and over here September and November 12th you can just see how the the penetration here on the West Coast and over here on the East Coast too as well as in Texas how that's increased substantially and we're not finished yet but that will give us wide area visibility when we get all the applications finished and get the systems deployed and everybody talking to each other too that's more than just the sensors there so if we did publish these reports the four reports and actually a this is a progress report and four reports on Volt VAR what we found in Volt VAR improvements advanced metering infrastructure reliability reports here and this is a demand reduction they're available also in smartgrid.gov so let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity how do we do this well 2009 we really didn't have many standards on how to implement cybersecurity in these new devices these new devices new communications but yet we under the Recovery Act I don't know if you all remember this or not but if one of the objectives was to roll this money out fast we had this term called shovel ready which turned out to be turned out to be not so ready but we wanted to deploy these fast and so what we did was to we our goal was to build in security from the get-go on these projects we want to make sure the projects were adequately addressing them from from the design selection of vendors all the way through testing deployment and testing in compliance at the end and then the management over the life cycle so we pulled together an interagency team consisting of Department of Homeland Security the Central Intelligence Agency FERC NIST and some subject matter experts and put together these high-level kind of requirements we did these high-level requirements we didn't want to be too prescriptive we didn't want to tell the utilities exactly how to do these plans that we wanted because every technology was different every scope was different and in the end one of the really big reasons for doing this this way was that when these projects are over we'll be leaving and the utilities will own these systems so they're the ones who are responsible for owning them as we leave and so we developed this kind of high-level process but this wasn't altogether new we had actually been working with the industry to develop profiles since about 2008 when we started working with the we formed the ASAP SG group there it is there I am all right we were I think we had developed a draft of the security profile with this industry group this was a cost share project here with these guys we put in half the money and they put in half the money and since and since that time we we've developed the third-party data these other profiles into distribution third-party data access and they're all available and smart grid of PDA dot org but this this group and this work that we provided actually helped feed into the NIST document that's that's now been published and this work was done by NIST they did a great job this is a result of some of the funding that we provided out of Recovery Act 
But uh, again, they brought the industry together, developed the whole smart grid interoperability panel, the framework, and they've been moving out really smartly on this. And, and this is some great work here. But we still have, I, I say that I think we have a, lot, a long ways to go here because this is still kind of high level, not prescriptive documents. Now, uh, just a little sidebar here. Um, one of the issues had, and I don't know if this was coincidental or not in 2009, but as this funding was starting to move forward, uh, a number of our cybersecurity researchers um, released uh, some um, data, or I'll just say some information, on some work they had done in hacking smart meters. Uh, there was one particularly at Black Hat uh, where they showed how you could hack a smart meter and then they put on YouTube a video where you could, it, it would become viral through this wire, wireless environment and go through about 25 homes in about, about 20 minutes, I mean 25,000 homes, about 20 minutes. And this caused some concern. Uh, particularly, uh, the, what we were aware there, there weren't really firm standards, but this is all new technology. If we wait around for the standards to be finished, uh, we're going to be here a long time. Uh, so we wanted to move forward, but we also wanted a way to say, you know, is this really a risk? Is this a big problem? How big a problem is it? Can I really hack these meters and take down a whole city, turn out the lights? How do I know? So um, I tasked uh, the Pacific Northwest National Lab, and, and Jeff Daigle has gone through this presentation a few months ago. Uh, so I, I'm just going to kind of say what the motivation here was. Uh, and we want to know if, we, if you were able to take control of thousands of meters, what would happen? So what Jeff and his folks did, they modeled the whole Western electric uh, uh, area, region. Well, I say they modeled, they used an existing model actually from the WAC. Uh, and th these areas in circles here show the various, uh, I think there's reliability areas uh, around the WAC. <coughs> so this is simplified. But what they did is they said, okay, we're going to measure uh, what happens if I drop <coughs> a load at this point, at this point, this point, this point, this point, and see what the response of the grid is. So what they did is they, they dropped 1,500 megawatts, the equivalent of 1,000 megawatts, and looked at those various parts around the grid. For example, Alberta up there in Canada got the largest response here, they're the most farthest away, but you can see how it, they got the large response from the dropping of 1,500 megawatts, but it did dampen out in steady state. Here is Arizona down the south, and these other areas I pointed to, but you can see they all kind of stabilized, which tells us that the grid will respond, we will have some outages. But you're not going to, uh, it will remain stable. So this was kind of comforting. But we have to remember everything about models, right? There's, there's uh, lies, damn lies, statistics, and models. So we have to be very careful what these models tell us. But we thought that really the only way to counter some of these claims that go out there is through data. We need to provide some facts on what the reality is. And that, that was the motivation behind that project. So i just quickly show the process. Uh, the process here, what we, we our role, we, we decided to partner with the, the utilities on these plans. Uh, each. So here's our role, we develop the requirements, we conduct site visits, shared lessons learned, the utilities develop the plans, implement them, improve the posture. We put together some resources, some webinars, some workshops, because then we're all learning as we're doing here to help everyone along the way improve their, um, their work. Uh, just some milestones, well, so far we've done, all the plans have been approved for about a year now, We've completed over, uh, so we have a team led from uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, subject matter experts who go out with our project officers to site visits to all 99 projects once a year uh, as part of their site visits to uh, kind of kick the tires kind of thing. 
And uh, we've completed those. And what I'm going to be showing you is some lessons learned from those site visits, from the development of the plans, as well as from the workshops that we've had in working with the utilities. So I don't want to bore anyone, but I don't know any other way. If we struggle with this, how to show this to you. Uh, the, the bad news is this is, this is a little bit tedious here, these bullets, but I'm not going to read every one. The good news is we've got a report that will be coming out uh, the end of this month that has all this information in it uh, from the uh, workshop we just held back in December. So I'll just highlight a couple of these, and these again are, are what some of the findings and working with the utilities uh, as far as the best practices. Uh, these are some things that the utilities are actually doing above and beyond the plans that we required. For example, uh, continue to assess risk through st all stages of the project life cycle. Uh, this one here, reverse engineer devices and penetration testing to determine security issues. So we broke them down these categories. Uh, the standards following the standards. Uh, this one here, uh, I didn't mention it, but as part of our plan, every plan that was developed by the utility had to be signed by a member of the board of the utility. So we wanted, we wanted high level accountability all the way up to the uh, corporate board. Uh, these are four more areas here, uh, methodology, attempts to predict, so they were predicting risks uh, to exposure proactively versus kind of waiting around for things to happen. Um, under policy and procedure, uh, this is one where the, they were working with a certain vendor and they actually had to, what they call here, retire that vendor because they weren't meet, being able to meet the functions that the utility was asking for. Uh, and here are the number of things here. One I, one I like particularly like is to include third-party communications and backup off-site where they do uh, data prevention and try to minimize these kind of third-party connections. Third and final chart here, another eye chart here, but I'll just highlight a couple up here. The firewalls, uh, monitoring and logging from existing security capabilities on internet-facing networks. That starts to get a little bit scary there. Um, Remote access by third party to various systems allowed on an as needed limited basis and is closely monitored. That's this one here. Uh, this is an interesting one here. Person, personnel performance metrics and compensation tied to standards compliance. And again down here, third party independent audit conducted to include project information security program and internal and external vulnerability assessments of the organization's technical systems. One of the things we found to have some antidotes through this process was um, by requiring that the utilities develop these plans, it actually brought a number of the, uh, the internal organizations together. For example, the IT department and the operations technology department. This kind of pulled them all together and actually in one utility, they, they took this plan and they developed it across the enterprise. In other words, they extended it beyond their project because they liked it so much that they're deploying it across the whole enterprise. So we had some very good response from this. Uh, we had no idea going in. We kind of gave it our best, best uh, guess at, uh, from where we were. And I want to highlight this. this is, I'll call this another best practice, but this is actually a, it's called the Guide to Developing a Cybersecurity Risk Mitigation Plan. The folks at NRECA, uh, they have a project uh, that they're managing with 23 co-ops. So each one of those co-ops had to develop a plan. So what they did is they said, well, let's try to help all of them at once. They don't need to go through this all by themselves. And they developed a guide on how to do it. And this is really a great tool. They also developed a 78-question procurement guide that will help the utilities and the products they buy ensure that they're, they've got the proper level of security built in. Uh, it's been very popular. Uh, it's been downloaded now 4,000 times by others. So uh, kudos for NRCA, to NRCA for building this. Uh, they got some other really neat things they're doing too across those projects. 
So I want to get out of those for just a minute. I have five minutes, so I think this is good. And just talk about a couple initiatives that we're working on that are directly related to the Smart Grid Investment Grants. But they're a little bit separate. This is the maturity model, electricity sector cybersecurity maturity model that we developed a year ago, working with DHS and the industry to look at the question of, well, the question we get here was from the Deputy Secretary or even the Secretary saying, is the power grid secure? They say, you know, we get some folks that say that it's very secure, not a problem. We've got other folks say all the things ready to fall down any minute from cyber attacks. What's the truth? And we really don't have a lot of data to answer that question. But so this is actually put forth and to solve a number of, that's one of the questions we have to solve with this, but also help to address one of the issues that utilities have and how to allocate resources in cybersecurity. How do we put them in the right place? How do we convince our management that we're deploying the technologies in the right area? Where are our weaknesses? So this was a great project. We worked with industry. It was done in about five months. And I'll just go through this quickly and give you some highlights here. These are the 10 domains that utilities do the assessment. Either they can do an assessment or they can have a facilitated assessment to work with them and help them pull together so they're kind of consistently answering the questions. This is a self-assessment. It could be a self-assessment or I just said facilitated. But these are the domains, the 10 with the short names here, risk, asset. And I want to point out that when we developed this tool, we didn't try, we didn't start from the beginning. We tried to leverage things like the DHS CSET tool, other tools that had already been developed. So we got to try to get the best of the best in doing this. So let's just look at kind of how this works across the 10 domains. I didn't do this slide, but I think it's really cool that they've done this. It's an animation here as long as you don't mess it up. So we have these 10 domains and three maturity indicator levels, actually four, excuse me, that you assess progress in each domain. And actually there's one that's reserved for later. One of the issues we ran into with utilities, and we knew this all along, but with the security, as everyone I think out there knows, is if you don't have really an end state, you don't have 100% security, you have, it's a process, kind of a continual improvement. So we put like a four on top or a five on the top level. Folks were concerned that they've been finished. If I get a four, I'm finished. I don't have to do any more. But we were trying to come up with a way to convey the notion that it's really a continuous development process. So that's why the little X is reserved. We'll figure out how to do that later. So in each cell, you can address where you are in these capabilities, define the practices in that domain. So you measure yourself in that domain. So a little bit here, these are some indicators here. Someone has scored actually a maturity indicator level two, where they fulfilled everything in maturity level two, which had two requirements, two practices. And this level here had 13 practices. And so they've done 11 of those 13, and the red indicates they're deficient in two. So you say, wonder what those two are. Okay, 13 processes in total, including the two from maturity indicator level one. 11 practices are fully implemented. I just talked about that, didn't I? And then, so this is kind of what they came up with, so that you can see that the practices, okay, where we are in those maturity levels, which ones they specifically missed, which I think was what, two here? Is that two, Dave? MIL 2B and MIL 3E. So these two? Well, the bottom one. This one? And then the, go up to MIL, and then. This one? B. Oh, this one. Bravo. Yeah. This one here. Oh, MIL 2, I'm sorry. MIL 2B, yeah. So then you can say, hey, we're a little bit deficient in this area. Strategy provides an approach for risk prioritization. So 
you can go back and say, well, I think we may need to look at what our peers are doing, what the guide says, and maybe consider a little work in that area to improve our process. So that rolls it out. So and this is kind of an executive level report uh, across those domains that shows you, this is the score of the square and this shows you that this particular utility did really well in the asset category, did really well in the threat category. Uh, here's the industry average. Uh, they didn't do so well in this area as we say to assess, so they might want to consider, particularly compared to the average, that maybe we ought to look at what we should do in this area. So this is a really good tool. And I'm going to skip real quickly because I can't get away without talking about Carol's uh, cybersecurity R&D program says she's doing a great job. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, but I, I, I do want to kind of highlight a couple things here. The process that we're using here, uh, mainly to say that what we're trying to do is uh, have a portfolio of projects going from the higher risk and move those projects from the research side into the development, into the uh, uh, into deployment. So we're about results. How do I get, it's not just about doing research, we're doing research, we want to, although sometimes you have to do a little bit of that, but we want to get some of these results driven by the roadmap uh, to achieve energy uh, sector cybersecurity into this area where we're actually developing products, tools that will make the, help the industry be, become more secure. Uh, some exa good example of that process is the, the Lemnos project that was originally developed by uh, Sandia National Lab, uh, move forward, uh, provide security and interoperability, uh, kind of a configuration file for uh, vendors to build to. Uh, that project has now been moved, this uh, framework that was developed in Sandia is now being commercialized by a number of vendors uh, to provide uh, uh, various products out there. Uh, and one, another one of those that uses the profile now is the Padlock. Uh, which securely connects distribution fuel components. This is a, a widely uh, a product that was well received in the marketplace. Uh, the utilities actually demanding it. Uh, for how to, particularly with a smart grid, where you have devices that are out in the field that can be accessed physically, this device gives you a way to, to uh, better protect them and know if anyone's tampered with. And uh, this, uh, of course, is the network uh, app tool, NETAPT. Developed by TSIP G folks, this is moving into the market too. This is a great tool, provides a way to uh, reduce cost, uh, to picture your network, and then through Sophia to actually, well, to look at your policies. Do I have the right policies in place and ensure those policies are being enforced through the Sophia? So, where do we go from here? Uh, this is, I'm with these two charts. These, this chart here shows, uh, this is done by, uh, give credit here to the Bloomberg Energy folks. They briefed us back in February. This shows the spending by segment in billions uh, for smart grid technologies, uh, advanced smart grid distribution and smart metering. So we see this peak here of 3.3 billion, 1.2, 5.1 in 2011, 2012. And so we're going forward, you see it kind of dying off, but. We see kind of a consistent level here of around $3 billion just in distribution on it. So what we want to do is try to leverage the work here and maybe even get that number to go something like that. And even further into the future, where, where do we see the next, the next wave? Uh, what we are finding with uh, many of the projects now they're deploying all these points out there, they're getting the communications deployed uh, and they're getting this data back in their back office. What do we do with all this data? How do we analyze it? How do we put it to work? How do we improve our performance? How do we reduce the cost? How do we improve our efficiencies? As the loads are changing, as we move to more renewable resources, how do we use this data to better improve our system? So that's where I want to stop, Bill. Um, I'll open up the questions. I want to thank everybody for the time. I'm sorry if I ran over any, but uh, thank you everybody for the attention on a Friday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hank. We really appreciate that. I'm, we have time, about 10 minutes for questions. I'm sure there are questions in the room here. If you could come up to the mic. And if you are online and have questions, 
uh, please just type them in the chat window and we'll ask them for you. Uh, so I guess I get the honor of the first question, Hank. So Tim Yardley, University of Illinois. Um, obviously, there was the presidential executive order that uh, came out uh, addressing critical infrastructure. Um, so mm -hmm. to, to toss that one at you, how, how do you feel that will affect the acceleration and, and uh, application towards cybersecurity in the energy sector? Um. You really like to put us on the spot, don't you, Tim? Just kind of go right for the jugular, don't you? Um, no, but that process will be rolling out pretty quickly. Um, I see it. Uh, I think Pat's, uh, Assistant Secretary Pat Hoffman will be talking about this uh, next week, I believe, at the uh, NASIO meeting. Um, and so, if, yeah, I think she's going to have a webinar. If you want to this, you can participate in that and hear more. Um, but I think it, it'll actually give us a way to... Uh, uh, move this forward a little bit faster, get some focus, get people together on it. Uh, the federal folks and bring together the partners, you know, the NIST, DHS, uh, FERC, uh, NERC, uh, utilities, vendors, and uh, it gives us a, a kind of a platform to have further drive the way these systems are being deployed. So uh, I think it's going to be helpful. It raises awareness, certainly, but uh, it's going to be a lot of work, too. A lot of work. We were just talking about that today and trying to plan for it. I don't know if I as much helped him, but I think Pat will probably be better able to answer the question next week. Thank, thanks, Hank. I would have wouldn't have let him ask the question if I knew what it was. Okay, we've got, we've got another one in this room, and I think we also have questions online. So you go ahead, and then we'll we'll take the online question. Hi, my name is Chuck Cam, and I work for the University's Utility Group. Um, the reliability indices that you show those. Those are pretty significant improvements. Uh, was weather taken into consideration? And if it was, great. If it wasn't, uh, how much of an impact do you think that would have? And can you comment on how you think smart metering helped uh, safety, which I think, in my mind, is mostly dependent upon the system condition and the weather? OK. Um, so those. Metrics were obtained using the IEEE process. I can't remember the spec number, but they all use that same process to measure that. And uh, I think there's uh, there's a way in there where they, they can take out the large events. I have to go back and look at the specification, but that was the methodology that all the project used. Um, as far as the, what was the other question on the, um, the meters? Yes, how did that improve the frequency of occurrence? Um, well, I think the project the project I showed you from Florida Power and Light was a distribution automation project. Right. And so it, that was, that's more about islanding, sectioning, detecting the fault, and then kind of rerouting the power. OK. Thanks. Uh, next, we have a question from online. Uh, Carl Benner asks, on your slide, what does predictive fault detection mean as applied to distribution feeders? Well, I, I think on a high level, what we're trying to do is say, not just measure it, not just kind of design for it, but how do we look in the future? How do we use some of the analytics to actually predict and anticipate the faults before they happen and put some put some uh, systems in place to address those before they happen. So it's kind of going from uh, looking in the rear view mirror to looking forward kind of thing. So that's uh, that's the notion there. I, I have to get some more data to help you out and get into more details. But that's about, that's the, these are kind of high level graphics. Whenever we start uh, looking into the future, you know, it's a little bit uh, dicey. It's hard to predict the future as Yogi Berra once said. It's hard to make predictions when it's particularly about the future. Thank, thank you, Hank. We have another question online. This is a, there's a really active online group here listening to you. Uh, this is from uh, David uh, Batagatoli. Uh, he asked, uh, oh, wait a minute. That's the wrong question. There's a whole queue of questions. This is from Brian Owen. And Brian asks about resilience. And he wonders if you have some insight on what is the biggest bang for the buck in achieving resilience. And by resilience, he means both 
operating reliably through accidental and natural disasters and through cyber attacks? Well, uh, we, we have some definitions um, of resilience, but mainly it's about you know, the ability to absorb a, an impact and recover quickly. Uh, so I think it depends on your system design. Resilience is not one simple concept. I mean, it's not one sing single metric, in my mind anyway. Um, we've looked at uh, putting some numbers on this, putting some metrics on it. One way is actually the number of uh, uh, advanced sensors you have out there to better, to better detect what's going on and the kind of control system you have in place to better detect and address anomalies as they happen. So uh, the resilience concept, I mean, it, it's kind of a higher thing, but it's more about you know, take a look and, and keep on ticking kind of thing. But uh, when we start talking and applying those to systems, and I think, uh, I think the TCFG folks are doing some metrics on resilience. Oh, no, the Software Engineering Institute is doing some work on looking at the metrics for the resilience concept. But it's, uh, it's one of those things that we, that we need to move more towards in the future. Thanks, Hank. And we're doing some work on it, too. You were right. Here's another. There's a whole queue of online questions. Here's another one. Uh, the telecommunication industry provides much of the communications infrastructure over which smart grid information flows. How is DOE engaging this industry? Uh, but, well, through the, through the investment grants, the utilities, we work directly only with the recipient, which in this case is the utility. They, they'll have contracts with uh, uh, the telecommunications sector. Now, at a higher level, we work with the telecommunications sector mainly through the coordinating councils and DHS. Uh, they, they, I believe they have the sector responsibility for the telecommunications sector. But those, that's kind of where the conversations go together. DHS has a responsibility for the uh, interdependencies across uh, critical sectors. Uh, DOE has a responsibility for the energy sector, electricity and oil and gas. So that's where we kind of come together in those issues with the telecommunications folks. Okay, Hank, we have time just for one more question, and it's from someone you know well from Himanshu Karana uh, from Honeywell, and he says, great talk, thanks. You mentioned site visits and lessons learned. Were there any key differences between transmission, distribution automation, and consumer system projects given that there are differences in requirements and regulations in those different domains. So he's wondering if the, if you look across transmission, distribution, automation, and consumer systems, were the lessons learned distinct or the same? It's hmm. a good question. Juancho, how are you? I hope, hope you're nice and warm up in Minnesota. <laughs> but, um, um, I, I think, uh, you know, that's a really good question. I'll have to go take that one back to our subject matter experts at PNNL and kind of ask them to compare notes. Um, because the tra actually the transmission projects we have are pretty separate. Although Florida, like, like Florida Power Light it has a pretty comprehensive project, but uh, many of those are, are kind of almost standalone transmission only projects. Uh, we've got 10 of those mostly being addressed through the NASPE work in that forum. So, uh, but let me, uh, I'll go back to them and I'll email you, uh, see if we can come up with an answer. Okay, well I wish we could go on. There's actually some more questions online and some more here, but uh, we've got to end. So thank you very much, Hank. We appreciate you uh, being here, or being here virtually. We wish you could have been here in person, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the technology really worked and we appreciate that you could give this presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for coming together.